You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies. And today, my guest is Grammy and Emmy, Grammy and Emmy nominated composer David Schwartz. And we're going to be talking about a, a wonderful, wonderful documentary entitled Lucy and Desi that was directed by Amy Poehler that is going to be premiering at the Sundance Film Festival. Welcome to the show, David. Well, thank you for having me. You're, it's my pleasure. There's so much to talk about with this film. First of all, I love, love, love this documentary. I cried. I was crying at the end oh, of wow. it. Yeah, it really touched me and on a deeper level because it was such a beautiful love letter to Lucy and Desi. And um, to see, even though they got divorced, that endearing love that they had for one another right to the very end. And I'm going to start crying now. So, <laughs> yeah. well, um, just beautiful. Break. Sorry? No, the, uh, no, I said, uh, yeah, it makes everybody cry. It, it came out wonderful. Uh, even over post, it was changing a lot. It, it, it's, I think it's a really interesting story that even people who know a tremendous, you know, even big Lucy fans will find things that they didn't know. And I think it really portrays that relationship powerfully. And and you're right. It, it's about the fact that the love lasted way after their divorce. It's very interesting that way. Um, and uh, they they always loved each other. And especially Desi, you know, he just credited Lucy for everything correctly. And you know, he was, all the things he did were amazing too. I don't know. I loved the story. I loved writing the music, and it was a great experience. You know? I want to talk about this because almost every section of the film had its own music. And it changed. And so that was just really interesting to me. So tell me a little bit about that and, and how you were able, you know, there wasn't, it was just very unique when you're listening. And, and it was, it was, the music was just um, such a wonderful compliment to the story. Sometimes the music can, you know, just really stands out and it almost can overpower, um, you know, a film. And this didn't, it just, it just, it was perfect in the way that it um, highlighted each section of the film. So talk a little bit about that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and yes, you're right. You know, I've done, I've, done, I've done all different kinds of scores. And, you know, I would think of, you know, like Arrested Development, which I did from the beginning of that. You know, that's a wild score for a wild show. And the music is out front in a way that's very cool. And uh, other things like The Good Place are separate universe but this was you know and, and documentaries are different and i know we wanted to, to to highlight the drama and emphasize certain things but you don't want documentary music to take over so you know you're just finding the line and also finding the line between comedy and drama uh which is something i've talked with amy a lot about and i don't know i think i just start at the beginning and keep on going i don't know if i think about total structure and as thematically as some people do i i just see the picture and I start writing notes and I see if it works. And sometimes it does. And sometimes I go back and change it. And then, you know, it just starts to develop as you're doing it. Um, when when I got hired for it, I think I started way before we, I talked to Amy. Um, I got hired by Morgan Sackett, a wonderful producer who's used me on a few things. And he's very close with Amy. And you know, so I just started, ideas started coming into my head and I started writing them so that when I would meet to spot the movie with Amy, I had music. And it took a while to get there, maybe three weeks or so that I was reading, writing. And um, when she heard it, she really liked the themes and chose some over others. But I still felt like there was a lot more work to do. Like she was saying she liked it, but I felt like, you know, you have to hear it to really know what you're loving. And, and then we started to work together. And, um, you know, I'd send what I did every day to her and sometimes it would come back with notes and sometimes the next week there would be notes. And I think we started to find it. And Amy had, I initially imagined it to be lighter, more comedy, but she really wanted to bring out the, the drama of the story. And so once I started to see where she was going, and uh, uh, that really helped a lot. And then we started to have a sound and I knew I was writing for an orchestra, so that was great. And we got to use a small orchestra, which is always a thrill these days. And we got to do it here, not in Eastern Europe, where a lot of scores are done. Nothing wrong with that, but I wanted to do it here with my players. So it, 
it came out great. Uh, and I think the thing about the sections, I think that just sort of happened as, as I was writing and as Amy was giving notes and let's use this here and let's try this one here. And, you know, she definitely had reactions to certain things. Like she didn't want, like, I love the Cuban music and I love Desi's Cuban music. So I thought there'd be more of that. And so, you know, each time she said, oh, that's great. You know, do we have to have the conga drums there? And I said, well, it was for Desi, you know, and she says, well, let's wait. Let's wait until at least they meet, which is later in the movie. And, and when they meet, we were allowed to use them just a little bit. So um, it was great to get to use that with the orchestra. Yeah, I, and I love that. I love the conga music. And, it, yeah. you know, and it, it just give you, gave you a better perspective on, on Desi, you know, for, for many people who don't know who he was and what he's about. There's a resurgence right now, obviously, with being the Ricardos also on Amazon. And yeah. this documentary is also going to be on Amazon. Uh, why do you think that is? Do you have any thoughts about that? You know, you know how things just happen together in time. And I, I don't know if there was any plan there about that. I, I hear it being the Ricardos is great. I haven't seen it. I look forward to seeing it. It is. Um, it's very, very good. It, it is. Well, great. Yeah. great. Yeah. Because, but also, I didn't want to do it while we were working on it, you know, and I still might need a couple of months. <laughs> I ha have a copy of it at home and uh, I I'll watch it, you know. It, it, I have to sort of separate those things. I didn't want to be influenced in that way. No, and no, no, no. I, I hear it's great, you know, so. It is. I mean, yeah. It, it, it's it, very it, different. I mean, that, from what I understand, being the Ricardo's is one week in time and a very interesting week. And we're covering, you know, their whole careers and the meeting and and you know all the things that Lucy and Desi did for modern television and show business in general are amazing I don't think many people realize that well she led they they led the way you know yeah. they were the you know the groundbreakers and uh, breaking boundaries um, yeah. during that time period on all levels and um yeah, I think you would like being the Ricardos after you see this too. It's, they're very good compliments to one another, actually. So well, that's what we were hoping for. We, we when yeah. we started talking about it, we were hoping that, that people would see one and want to see the other. Oh, no question, no question about it. And it doesn't make any difference which one you see first. To be okay. honest with you, um, either way, you could either either one because they are a wonderful compliment. I loved how this one obviously goes. Um, much deeper into, you know, everything. I mean, the archival footage that um, that they found, I mean, of her family back in Jamestown and all of that. I mean, who had kind of, the, uh, obviously footage of her as an actress, but that older, you know, um, archival footage of her family and Ricky's yeah, family. Too. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. Truly, it is. So, okay, so you talked a little bit about with Amy, she gave you notes and you went back and forth. What, um, was there anything about working uh, on this that was unique and different compared to other projects that you've worked on before, David? Uh, every project's really unique. So, and, and if you think that, it, you know, it's like having children and expecting them to be the same, you know, it's not. <laughs> and they're all wonderful, so. So, you know, I thought after the first TV show I did, oh, it'll be like that, but it's not. It's different people with different goals and totally different music. And, uh, you know, it's great to come in there with a plan. I always do, but you also have to be flexible to change as it goes on. And I don't do a lot of docs. Um, the last one I did was the Hunter Thompson doc that Alex Gibney directed and was at Sundance. And so the docs I've done have been great ones. Uh, and I like to do them and it's really fun. And Alex uh, on that doc really wanted very, you know, Hunter Thompson rock and roll, very forward, the kind of music that he was known to listen to and jazzy stuff. And so that was also not a typical documentary score. I don't even know what a typical documentary score is. But, uh, and, and although I've used an orchestra a few times in the last few years on The Good Place and other shows, uh, it was great to know that you're writing for an orchestra because then you, you know, you have the players, you know what they can do and you're writing towards that goal. Um, it's, it's a very different feeling for me as a composer to know that I'm writing for an orchestra rather than a small ensemble in my studio. And whatever I'm doing, I try to use as many real players as I can. And, you know, I can make great demos that sound great to show to producers and directors. But to me, the real fun and the music gets to you know, double in value when we have players on it who are great and add what they can to it. 
like, where does it, um, it's, it's always been interesting to me that you just, you said you had some music before you even met Amy um, for this project. No, right? Well, let me quick, I, I, I've known Amy before. I, I, um, I like to say I acted in her movies. I, 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 I'm in wine country in the opening scene and I have one line and I, I well, anyway, it was, it was great. And I, I, I've, I've met Amy at different things. You know, she did Arrested Development and uh, anyway, but I, I certainly spent that uh, couple of days in Napa Valley on her. It was the most fun. She had the greatest crew and the nicest people. And uh, we worked hard and it was beautiful up in Napa. And, you know, I brought a little trio there and we, you know, we play the part of a band. Uh, but uh, it was really fun to do that. But what I was saying is before meeting with Amy, and it's not music that I had, it's music that I'm now trying to create themes before, you know, I actually got the picture. I just don't like to walk into a room with nothing. And I, 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 even if they're going to say, oh, that's totally wrong. Can we try this? At least we have something to talk about. Or we like this part, but we don't like that part. So, so if that's what you were asking, I was saying, I like to write some themes before uh, anything starts. If I have the time. Very often you start... And, and you're working the next day and meeting the people, it just, you know, the schedules can really vary wildly. But I like to have a little extra time just to start thinking of ideas. So um, this one, when did you start getting pieces of the documentary and then you wrote music for it? Or were you already aware of where she was going and you already had some things in your head? How did, how, what's your process? How do you create wrote, what you I create have, amy was not available i think she was out of the country so we really i didn't have any anything i didn't have the video yet and then i think i can't remember the timing but maybe after a couple of weeks of me writing just in my head to nothing which is a different experience than writing to picture mm -hmm. uh i got the picture and then i started to write to the picture and it was a very rough cut so you know they, they always tell you don't you know, don't use these timings, but you still have to time it out, even if it's a rough cut. And then I think we got two more cuts after we had spotted. So, you know, we got together at a spot. Um, I've told this before, but, uh, you know, it was a pandemic. We're in, a, in uh, an editing office in, in Beverly Hills and there was a power outage uh, right after I got to the editing room and a Amy was still uh, not there and, and the elevators wouldn't work. And she just says, well, I'll just go up the stairs. And then she calls us back five minutes later. And the, and the building owner had come out and would not let her use the stairs, claiming that stairs were dangerous. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> she finally, kidding. when he wasn't looking, snuck up the stairs. So we had a very short meeting because the first hour was, uh, you know, it was, it was a kind of Lucille Ball story of her trying to get into the editing office. And then I think we had an hour and a half together. So, you know, for that's not even the length of the movie. So, so. It, there wasn't a lot of, you know, getting together in person because of the pandemic. I was going to ask you. I, I really encourage it. I like to go to meetings. I like them to come to my studio, whatever, however it works. The more FaceTime you can have is great. But we did that with Zooms and phones the way people are doing now. Right, right. I was going to ask you if you did during the pandemic. I was assuming you did. Uh, yeah, it's all Zoom now. Uh, in fact, this was the only meeting I've had in the last since the pandemic started that was in person, that one meeting with Amy, which was broken elevators and shortened. I think um, this is the way we're going to be doing everything from now on. I think you're right. I mean, <laughs> I I really like when we finish a movie, you know, to go to the stage and watch it being put in with the film and being there. A lot of composers don't and a lot of composers don't because they get criticized, you know, music's being um, not used or changed or whatever, but I feel like I can be helpful there. And I see what they're seeing when they see it at that time. So if there's a problem, I can say, well, maybe try this or lower it or, you know, use a different part of it because I don't know, I think that's part of the process if I can and if they're comfortable with me being there. And uh, we can do that on a Zoom, but it's that that's an area where it's not the same, not being in the room. Hopefully, we're we'll maybe it's going to become a combination. You know, the Zoom right. will shorten the time. The orchestra time. I was there. You know, Sorry? I, lucky. I said when we, when we recorded the orchestra in El Segundo, um, yeah, I was there. So that was great. And, you know, if it, if, if it had been now, you know, the current Omicron situation, we probably would have had to do something else. Yeah. It, you know, no, this film is premiering, as I said, at Sundance in 
believe it's coming up. Uh, and will you be doing Zoom interviews for that? I guess this is one, and yes, and I did one with Amy for BMI, which was great. And uh, yeah, you can really, when you have Amy on the interview, you, you you know you're just covered. She's just so good at it and so funny and, and just a really nice person. Uh, so yeah, we both Amy and I had been planning on going to Sundance, and I haven't been in a few years. And um, it would be great, you know, it'd be fun to be there in the snow, but it, it's also a very packed environment of people and I think they made the wise decision to make it virtual one more year. I agree with you, I know, I, I agree with you. I'm but it is really a fantastic thing to be there. It is, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's um, Well, I, I lived in Salt Lake City for seven years and the seven years wow. that I, this is before I was doing what I'm doing currently, a long time ago, and I volunteered for the seven years for the Sundance Film Festival. So. You know, I've always loved going there and being there. And then I moved away and you know, I've been going back for quite a few years now. You know, and this... Well, I'm losing you a little bit audio wise oh, somehow. Okay. But you know, and you're not better. coming out. Can you hear me now? I just hope what you're recording is good. You know, yes, I, can I hope so too. <laughs> for the poof of me in the again. pudding afterwards, we'll see. Better, I feel like take. I'm super hot. I'm watching it, actually, I'm watching this monitor and I'm super hot and you're very light. So, Hopefully it will turn out. I'm cold. Uh, <laughs> but you must have had that experience because I, I, a long time ago, lived in Woodstock, New York. And then there were times where all the tourists came in. So you must have, you know, Salt Lake City is probably quiet most of the year. And then ski season and then Sundance come. It's a very different experience. It is. It's a, it's a great city. I love Salt Lake City. I actually worked for the Olympics. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> the 2002 Winter Olympics. That's why I was there. And and, uh, and that's why I was able to volunteer in my off time. So yeah, so, so very exciting time to be in Salt Lake City. So mm -hmm. very much that's that. Cool. But I love snow and I miss the bad weather. I'm from the East Coast originally. So I do like the bad weather. I, you know, I'm looking at all these uh, blizzards and I'm going, oh my God, I love all of that. <laughs> I wish I was there. People go, are you crazy? <laughs> See, I, I, I'm from New York, but me I too. prefer this. <laughs> Where in New York? I live right down in Manhattan. Uh, you know, I was born in New Jersey, so New Jersey, New York, Connecticut. I studied film and acting in New York a million years ago. So, wow. Yeah. Right. I but miss I, New York. I, I, I don't want to live there in the winter. It doesn't look, you know, I, that, you that know, I wouldn't want to be there for all the time, but <laughs> it's fun every <laughs> once in a while. That's why I like going to Sundance. At least you get your snow fix, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful there. It is. It is a beautiful place. For you, what was the most difficult? Um, filming when you were writing the music for this, was there a section of this film that you really had some difficulty finding something that you uh, could, you created that you really loved or didn't like, or did you have what what issues and problems did you have while you were trying to create the music oh, for I, this? I forget film? so fast; it all seems easy now. But I'm <laughs> sure no, there was a lot. There was a lot of music, and it was changing, and then. Uh, at the end, we added more places for music. So just getting through it and make it all that it felt consistent to me. And I was going back and trying to make things more consistent. And then there was, you know, the, the, the first thoughts were like, oh, let's make music of the 50s and Cuban music and, and, and that kind of thing. And then Amy really wanted it to be modern and she that was totally correct. So, you know, except for a few places where it was great to have the older sounds. I started modernizing it. It took a while to find, you know, it couldn't be over the top modern. You know, it just had to sort of be timeless and, and classic. And, and and that was her call and it went the right way. And Robert, our editor, was a great help. Um, and yeah, it, it's kind of you're in a bubble. And, you know, I'm here in this studio, which is lovely and has light and all these things. But I, I pretty much it was a lockdown in the studio for a couple of months. And, you know, if you give me more time, I'll just keep on working until the deadline happens. And uh, I remember about two days before the orchestra, I said, OK, that's it. I got to stop because it has to go to the orchestrators and then, you know, to the copyists. And that's a great thing about an orchestrator because the composer who's, you know, working around the clock until that point, then you have to hand it off and you kind of have to pull back and it gives you a minute to think about it before the orchestra comes. And if you're conducting the orchestra, which I didn't, Okay. You know, then you're still under pressure. But, you know, I could just sit back and, and hear things and make changes from the control booth. And that, that's a wonderful feeling, you know. And also, I have a great 
Lucas Richman was my conductor. He was also my conducting teacher years ago. And um, he's my favorite. And he lives in Maine year round. He conducts the Portland Symphony. And uh, so I called him. I said, is it possible? He says, oh, I'm coming in that week anyway. So, you know, it was great that it worked out that I had him for that week. And so, you know, things like that come together. And uh, and having all my favorite players was, was really, I don't know, it's just a treat to most composers that when we get that. Yeah. And, you know, L.A. has a great variety of amazing players. And so yeah. that's one of the things about living here that I love. Once you started the recording process, were there things that you began to change at all once you start or the orchestra and you go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound exactly what, how I had it in my head or what I was thinking. Did I, did you go back and revise anything? It, it, for a film of this size, it's pretty much you get one shot. You know? <laughs> okay. And, and uh, in fact, we recorded the orchestra. I thought we'd need seven hours and uh, my orchestra contractor was saying, no, we can get this in four and a half. And he did. And there was no compromise there. Uh, and, uh, and, and then, you know, while you're mixing, you're still shaping it and stuff like that. So it's maybe three days of mixing it in there. But I, there was no rewriting at that point. But it might be, oh, you know, we don't need this extra part here, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, if I had a bigger budget and a longer time, I might want to experiment and, and do things like you're talking about. But it, it was not an option this time. I had to well, stay it turned out beautifully, the whole film, and obviously the music is what evokes the emotion, you know, when you're watching a film, and this certainly did uh, evoke, you know, deep emotions in watching it, and it was, it, it just really is, it's a, a, everybody, please, um, Amazon Prime, go find um, Lucy and Desi for sure. What do you find is that you know, you've worked on a lot of television shows, as you mentioned, Arrested Development, The Good Place, many, many others, and you've been nominated for Emmys. What's the difference for you in creating for television versus uh, doing documentary work or film work, other film work? Uh, you know, I used to think there was more of a difference, but now I'm still, you know, sitting here writing. There's a picture in front of me and I'm creating music. And you know, hopefully you get more long form thematic music in a film. Um, and each film is totally different. So I don't find the differences to be that great. What, what, well, this, the TV has one advantage. If you do three seasons of something, you know, you get to keep on coming back of it and, and developing it. And, the, and that's, you know, just the nature of TV. So you get to do that. And when, it, when the season ends, you still have that job going on. And that's a nice thing. When a movie ends, it's like, well, what's the next thing? Uh, and, and that's different. But there's some depth to movies that, you know, still is special to that format. So I, I enjoy both. Uh, you know, I like to say, you know, uh, is it good? Then I'm into, you know, if it, it's Well, you've worked on some great um, projects. Great I've projects. been really lucky, yeah. really fortunate. I think because the first thing I ever did as a mere child was, uh, no, I was already an adult, uh, was Northern Exposure, because it's such an unusual show. And the way we did it was sort of like there's different music every week. So I got to sample something every week and, and it's just the way that show came out. And, and the seventh episode or the eighth episode, I did a big orchestra uh, and probably the biggest orchestra I've done to this day. I think we had 68 players or something like that. And, um, and Josh Brandt, who created Northern Exposure, came to me and says, have you seen the episode? And I said, I'm coming in to see it right now. I passed him in the hallway and he goes like, well, we need a really big orchestra, like 150 players. And I said, Josh, that's, you know, I, I'm not an expert in this yet, but you know, that's too many. And he says, well, then get as many as we can. <laughs> and that was a fantastic, you know, it, it scared you know, the life out of me. Um, but it worked out. And uh, so I got to learn how to do that. But, you know, every kind of music we tried in that French cafe music, um, African dance music and you know I had to learn how to do it and there wasn't time to call in other experts so I had to sort of figure it out uh, and yeah so so I think from the beginning I, I learned to do different things and I didn't become known for one thing which this is I think there's a great advantage to being knowing at certainly the beginning of your career you know 
and then people hire you to do that thing all the time. And if you do a lot of things, then people have to figure out, you know, why they're hiring you. And but but most projects change. You know, I I've gotten hired for numerous TV shows. Oh, this is going to be really edgy and dark. And you know, the second piece there's a sentimental piece. You know, a love theme that has to go. And so you have to be able to do both. You know, or do everything in a way. But you know, hopefully you bring your style to it, and it changes the show. There's a, there's a great reaction between what's happening on film and the music and they influence each other after a while. Oh, David, I have so many more questions, but unfortunately our time is up. So I would just thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, I look forward to having you back again. You know, well, something. I would love that. And this has been fantastic. And uh, I'm excited for the movie to premiere. And uh, hopefully we meet again soon. Definitely. Definitely. So again, thank you. And again, so everybody, uh, seek out Lucy and Desi on Amazon Prime. It's, it's just a beautiful love letter, as I said, to Desi and Lucy. If you have missed any of the Jam Price shows all about movies, you can find us just about anywhere that you listen to your favorite podcast, but you can also go to the jampriceshow.com where all the shows are archived. While you're listening to at the iHeart Podcast Network, Apple, Spotify, Google, you name it, we are there, but please rate our show when you're there, specifically on Spotify, rate our show. Also, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, and you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Jam Price Show. Thank you all for listening. 